Hello everyone and welcome back to the CLSR and I'm your host, The Counselor. Today we're going to be talking about a rather serious uh, disorder. It's called PTSD and that stands for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. I think there's a lot of assumptions being made about this disorder and actually I've been quite taken aback when I see some of these young people talking about PTSD. And uh, actually... I think today what we're going to do is we're going to get some clarification on this disorder. And I think once we're done, you will have a good understanding of the disorder and what are some of the causes and the symptoms. First, let's define what is post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, basically, it is a mental health condition, and it's triggered by a terrifying event. Uh, see, it could be something someone's experiencing, uh, something that's terrified them or it could have been a threat something that they might have witnessed um and some of these symptoms can include like flashbacks nightmares and severe anxiety and uncontrollable thoughts about an event and see when i'm seeing in a major metropolitan city all the gun violence and i think about the victims and my heart goes out to the families and i'm thinking these are environments where we're not even understanding the impact that it's having on our community. In addition to this current pandemic virus, these incidents that are happening on a daily basis can cause PTSD. And see, most people who go through traumatic events may temporarily have some difficulty adjusting and coping. However, with some time and some self-care, they can and they do have a tendency to get better. However, the symptoms can get worse, last for months or even possibly years, and can definitely interfere with your day-to-day -day functioning. And you may have PTSD. So I think it's important that you listen to this session that we're having now because you might be having some feelings. You might mistake it for depression or suicide and not understand that this is something that's happened and you might have to reflect on some of your experiences and see you know is there any correlation here and first we have to understand first what are the symptoms we need to be uh, acutely aware that uh, some of the ptsd symptoms may start within a month of a traumatic event but uh, it could also be uh, showing up even after a year of an event and they can cause significant problems in your social life, workplace, in relationships, and they can just really interfere with your ability to go about your normal daily tasks. And generally we could categorize PTSD into four types, intrusive memories, avoidance, negative changes in thinking and your mood, and changes in your physical or emotional reactions. Symptoms can vary over time, and it's different from person to person. So if you have intrusive memories, these include like re reoccurring events. So recurrent, unwanted, distressing memories of a traumatic event. Reliving this event, as if it were happening again, like it's almost like flashbacks. And then you have those upsetting dreams or nightmares about that event. And of course, it's connected with severe emotional distress or physical reactions to something that reminds you of that event. And next, we have to think about avoidance. And that's like, all you're trying to really do is trying to avoid or think thinking about or even talking about this event. You could even be trying to avoid places, activities, or people who remind you of this traumatic event. So when you experience these negative changes in your thinking and mood, this is when those negative thoughts about yourself or other people in the world occur. and Or memory problems. You might have those memory problems not remembering important aspects of this event, difficulty remaining close to people that you love because of this anxiety, this stress, this internal struggle that you're going through. 
the impact on your relationships can be quite damaging. You'd be feeling detached from families and friends, just a lack of interest in your activities that you once enjoyed. And you could even have some difficulty experiencing positive emotions, sometimes leaving you feeling emotionally numb. It's just like you don't even feel like yourself anymore. It changes you. You start to morph into somebody you, you don't even recognize at times, right? Changes in your physical and your emotional reactions. Being easily startled or frightened, always being on guard for danger, self-destructive behaviors such as drinking too much or driving too fast, and it could impact your sleep. You might not be able to sleep at night. You have trouble sleeping, waking up through all hours of the night, you're irritable, angry outbursts or aggressive behavior. It's just, it could be quite overwhelming for the people who have PTSD. You may have been known to feel some shame about it. See, when you think about the younger children, at least six years old or younger, their their signs can really be a little bit different, right? They could be reenacting this event through play or having those frightening dreams, you know, that may include some of the event that they had going on. And it could be something they're seeing in their families, whether it's violence from parents fighting or a death in the family. It's just the intensity of symptoms that we need to consider. We need to recognize that you could be feeling a lot of stress in general, and there could be certain things that you see that might increase the symptoms. Like you could experience like someone who um, is being violated on the news, you hear of a sexual assault, you hear of like people being shot or killed or someone being run over. This has a tendency to intensify the symptoms, right? It causes more stress and it could bring on more uh, severity of the PTSD. There are times when you need to consider when you should be seeing a doctor. So if you're having some disturbing thoughts and some feelings about this traumatic event, like for more than a month, per se, you know, if especially if they're severe and if you're feeling you're having trouble getting your life back under control, you're going to have to see someone. You're going to have to talk to your doctor or a mental health professional. Get some treatment as soon as possible that can help prevent the PTSD symptoms from getting worse. And what if it's someone you know? How are you going to help them? You're going to have to actually reach out to a close friend or a loved one. Contact someone that they trust. Like contact a minister, spiritual leader, someone in that community, even in the faith community. Call a suicide hotline number. In Canada, we have to call CAMH, Center for Addiction and Mental Health. I mean, you don't really need to be formal about it. If you're having these feelings, walk into a hospital. Let them know. Don't wait for a, a doctor's appointment. If you really need to get some support, you're going to have to take action, not wait around. I know a lot of us, we're not used to going for this help. We have a tendency to neglect ourselves, but we can't, not in these situations. So like, when it gets to an emergency situation... Or if you think you may hurt yourself or attempt suicide, call 911 or your local emergency number. If you know someone who's in danger of attempting suicide or has made a suicide attempt, make sure someone stays with that person to keep them safe. And if you can do so safely, after calling 911, take the person to the nearest hospital room. It's just something that you have to do. It's not something that you uh, wait around. It's, there's no time for that. You really have to react, you know, in the sense that you got to go, okay, let me get busy and do something to help myself or help this person. So if we're talking about PTSD, what are some of the causes? So how can you develop PTSD? Simply, uh, it could be something that you go through. See, you learn about an event involving actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violation. You see, doctors aren't really sure why some people get PTSD and others don't. 
However, they can come to some agreement that it's like more than likely a mixture of things like stressful experiences, including like the amount and severity of a trauma you've gone through or inherited mental health risks, such as like your family has a history of anxiety and depression. And these inherited features of your personality, often called your temperament. This is is one of the causes as well. And thinking about the way your brain regulates these chemicals and hormones your body releases in responses to stress is also a cause. There's a number of people that want to know uh, if it's age dependent or does it relate to people within certain age ranges. Well, in actuality, it doesn't. Uh, it could happen to people of all ages as PTSD. And, and some of the factors that are involved are like experience intense or long lasting trauma. Having to experience this in an early life, such as childhood abuse, having a job that increases your risk of being exposed to traumatic events, such as like military or police officer or fire uh, woman. Think about that. Like, could you imagine what they go through on their job, seeing people being shot, killed in fires, babies dying? All this is just a risk factor. You could also have other mental health problems, such as anxiety and depression, substance misuse, and you could be an alcoholic. You might have a substance problem. You know, you're drinking or drug use, lack of good support system in your with your family and friends is also a, a risk factor for you, right? And this blood relatives, the mental health problems, this is also has a serious correlation when it comes to risk factors. See, when I think of risk factors, we not we need to understand that there's risk factors and protective factors, but these risk factors will kind of determine if you're more resilient in handling this PTSD, the amount of risk factors that you have. If you if they're compounded, then you're going to be quite severe. And what kind of traumatic events are going to cause that? Combat exposure, childhood physical abuse, sexual violence, physical assault, being threatened with a weapon, an accident, right, that you might have had falling at work or a car accident. Uh, there are so many that could be attributed to these type of events. You know, like I said, fire, natural disaster, mugging, robbery, plane crash, torture, kidnapping, uh, life-threatening medical diagnosis. Think about people who've been diagnosed with cancer or, or MS, uh, debilitating diseases. And of course, terrorist attacks. You think of, for example, 9-11. What about the fallout from that? People think, oh, just the number of people that died. That's one thing. But what about the fallout from that? The people who've been highly affected. It's just changed their lives, these events. They're so traumatic, right? And they obviously are going through some serious complications. And sometimes we don't really see it. See, post-traumatic stress disorder can disrupt your whole life, your job, your relationships, your health, your enjoyment of everyday activities. Just having this can cause some depression and anxiety, issues with drug use, eating disorders, suicidal thoughts and actions. All of these are common reactions to trauma. However, the majority of people exposed to trauma do not develop long-term post-traumatic stress disorder. It's really important that you get some help. Getting help in a timely manner can prevent normal stress reactions from getting worse and developing actually into the PTSD. This may mean like turning to your family and friends who will listen and maybe offer you some comfort and support as well as seeking out that mental health professional for a brief course or therapy. Some people find it helpful to turn to the faith in the community. Any way that they can find help, I strongly recommend that you do because it is quite serious. However, a lot of the times people tend to think it's just going to be forever long term and they can't see their way out. Well, 
That's not really true. A lot of the cases are dealt with over a certain period of time, and there's some rather effective strategies that this thing could go away. And we do need to understand that with the appropriate treatment, it can dissipate for sure. There are definitely effective treatments out there. And I think now more than ever, it's important that we understand a little bit about diagnosis. So to diagnose most traumatic stress disorders, your doctor is most likely going to, number one, perform a physical exam to check for your medical problems that may be causing your symptoms. Number two, they're going to do a psychological evaluation, and this often includes a discussion of your signs, symptoms, and the events that may have occurred or led up to them. And number three, they're going to use the criteria outlined in the DSMV, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It's basically, that's what the doctors use. It's the American Psychiatric Association. That's what is a resource that they use to basically uh, diagnose some of these disorders. They look it up and uh, they, you know, they compare some of these symptoms to what you're giving them in this resource, and then they come up with this diagnosis. Uh, diagnosis of the PTSD requires exposure to an event that involved the actual or possible threat of death, violence, or serious injury. Your exposure can happen in one or more of the following ways. Like you could be directly experiencing the traumatic event. You could have witnessed it in person, this event. You could have learned someone close to you had been threatened by a traumatic event. Think about a young person whose parents were threatened or beaten or were constantly being threatened by someone. They could be seriously experiencing some of these symptoms. First responders are very well known in the profession to experience a lot of traumatic events, being on scenes, EMS workers, hospital workers, they're always dealing with some sort of event. And this accumulation could really cause these stresses and anxieties and some of these symptoms. You may have PTSD if the problems you experience after this exposure continues for more than that month. And you know, the treatment, it's, it varies, right? It can help you regain a sense of control over your life. And the primary treatment is psychotherapy. And that could include medication, a combination of, right, treatments with the medication. Or it could just be treatments that teach you skills to address these symptoms, help you think better about yourself, others in the world. You learn new ways to cope if any of these symptoms arise again, like if you start having these feelings again. It is quite normal that you can have these feelings again and just know that you don't have to handle this burden of PTSD on your own. When it comes to psychotherapy, just know that there are several types of psychotherapy. Talk therapy may be used to treat children and adults with PTSD. Um, cognitive therapy. And this is a type of of talk therapy, right, which helps you recognize the ways of thinking, cognitive patterns that are keeping you stuck, like making you think of these negative beliefs about yourself and the risk of traumatic things that could happen again. Like for PTSD, cognitive therapy, that is one of the most commonly used treatments for PTSD, along with exposure therapy. Right. Think of people who have these events happen and sometimes uh, therapists have to recommend that these people expose themselves a little bit so that they can gradually get over or work past it or get through it. And then you also have exposure therapy. And this is when um, you learn to safely face both the situations and the memories that you find frightening. You can learn to cope with them effectively. See, exposure therapy can be particularly helpful for flashbacks and nightmares. This uses virtual reality programs that allow you to re-enter the setting in which you experience trauma. And then you have the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. And it's otherwise known as the EMDR. And this combines exposure therapy with a series of guided eye movements that help you process traumatic memories and change how you react to them. 
See, your therapist can help you develop stress management skills to help you better handle some of these stressful situations. You'll learn to cope better in your life. See, all these approaches can help you gain control, and you don't have to do it alone. I mean, you may try individual therapy or group therapy or both if you feel it's going to help you. If you have a family member that is willing to support you, I strongly suggest that you enlist their help. One thing you do need to be mindful of, of some of the medications that uh, psychotherapists or your doctor may recommend, there are several types of medications that can help improve symptoms of PTSD. Think about antidepressants. These medications can help symptoms of depression and anxiety, and they can also help improve sleep problems and concentration, like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is known as the SSRI medications, Zoloft, uh, Paxil, uh, and these are approved by Health Canada for use with PTSD. Then you also have your anti-anxiety medications, right? These drugs can relieve severe anxiety related to problems. Some anti-anxiety medications have the potential for abuse though. That's where you need to be very careful and you need to monitor your intake in conjunction with your doctor. Your doctor will let you know that there will be side effects with some of the medication. Depending on your situation, you may um, see some improvement in the mood, but there will be some um, side effects that you may experience in the first few weeks. Just be open and upfront with your doctor about how you're feeling and if you're feeling any side effects at all. You may need to try more than one or a combination of medication. Your doctor may need to adjust your dosage and your schedule before finding the right medication that works for you. There are ways that you can find some support and actions that you can actually take to help you with PTSD. I'd like to recommend for support that you follow your treatment plan. Although it may take a while to feel the benefits of therapy or medications, treatment definitely can be effective and most people do recover. Remind yourself that it takes some time Follow your treatment plan and routinely communicate with your mental health professional. And this will help you move forward. I recommend and I always in every situation recommend that you learn about your situation. A little bit of education. See, people use this education and they only apply it to school. I'm a strong believer that we have to educate ourselves on us. Learn about ourselves. So learning about PTSD is just as important. This knowledge can help you understand what you're feeling. And then you can develop coping strategies to help yourself. And you can respond effectively. You got to take care of yourself. You got to get rest. You got to eat healthy. You got to diet. No drugs. No alcohol. You got to exercise. Take your time to relax. Try to reduce or avoid caffeine and nicotine. Right? Because this could, believe it or not, worsen your anxiety. And a lot of people say, no. I really loved my coffee. I got to have it. But just be mindful that you're dealing with caffeine, right? Don't self-medicate. I told you, turning to alcohol and drugs to numb your feelings, that's not healthy. Even though it may be tempting for you to cope this way, it can lead to more problems down the road. It could interfere with effective treatments and prevent real healing. You got to break the cycle. When you feel anxious, take a brisk walk or jump into a hobby to refocus. Stay connected. Spend time with supportive and caring people in your life, like your family, friends, faith leaders, and others. You don't have to talk about what happened if you don't want to. Just sharing time with loved ones can offer some support, help you heal, and consider a support group. Ask your mental health professional for help finding a support group. Contact veterans organizations, your community social service system, or look for local support groups online in a directory. And when someone you love has PTSD, make an effort to help. The person you love may seem like a different person than you knew before the trauma. They could be angry, irritable, and emotional, right? They might even be withdrawn or depressed. PTSD can significantly strain the emotional and mental health of loved ones and friends. Hearing about the PTSD 
that led to your loved one's trauma may be painful for you. If you if you don't know what they're going through, it's going to be strange territory. These people are living the events. They're having difficult events. You may find yourself avoiding them because you don't want to talk about it. You know, they might be feeling hopeless, but they need somebody and you might be there for them. But if you are afraid or you just don't know how to help, it's better you get some education. You can't fix your loved ones, but you can help them heal as they go through this process. Remember that you can't change someone, but there are things that you can do. You can learn about it. If it's strange territory to you, the best thing you can do is just learn about this Disorder, this can help you understand what your loved one is going through. Recognize that avoidance and withdrawal are part of this disorder. If your loved one resists your help, allow space. Let your loved one know that you're available when he wants it or she wants it or she's ready to accept, right? Offer to attend medical appointments. If your loved one is willing to attend appointments, that's a great thing. This will help them. Help them understand what they're going through. And it would also help you understand. You have to be willing to listen. Let your loved one know that you're willing to listen. But you have to understand if he or she doesn't want to talk, don't try to force it. Don't. It's a traumatic event. Until they're ready, do not force it. Encourage participation. Like plan opportunities for activities with family and friends. Celebrate good times. Make your own health a priority. How are you going to take care of somebody else if you can't take care of yourself? If you're actually with somebody who's going through PTSD, you shouldn't be engaging in all these negative behaviors like excessive drugs and drinking. They're just negative influencers. And these people are picking up. They're trying to reach out to cope and then they're seeing all this negativity out there. So it's not helping them at all. It's actually hurting them because they're going to pick it up to cope when they don't need. That's the last thing that they need. So you have to make your own health a priority, right? Doing activities that help you recharge and seek help if you need it. If you have difficulty coping, talk with your doctor. They may refer you to a therapist who can help you work through this stress, right? And stay safe above all else. Stay safe. Plan a safe place for yourself and your children if need be. See, if you're at that point where you've actually made a conscious decision to actually take some action, you have to prepare for your appointment, especially if you think you have PTSD. See, a lot of people don't know because it's thrown around these terms and there are symptoms and, and sometimes we can't put our finger on exactly what it is. But if you need to get assessed, please do that. If you're Even if you're unsure, it's better to be safe than sorry. So you, there are ways that you can prepare for your appointment. And I really suggest that you take a trusted family member or friend along with you, if possible. Because it can be difficult to remember all the information that they're going to be giving you. Right? So before you make the appointment, I really suggest that you make a list of any symptoms you've been experiencing for how long, any personal information, like especially events or experiences, even in your distant past, that made you feel intense fear, you were helpless, you had some scary events or things happening. It will help your doctor to know if there are memories you can't directly access without feeling an overwhelming need to push them out of your mind. You know, things you have stopped doing or avoiding because of your stresses, right? And make also a list of your medical information, including other physical or mental health conditions you may have or you've been diagnosed with and include any medications or supplements you're taking and the dosages and be prepared with questions to ask so that you can make the most of your appointment Try to keep it very basic. No multi-layered questions. Let them answer one at a time. So try to keep them as simple as you can. Like, what do you believe is causing my symptoms? Are there any other possible causes? How will you determine my diagnosis? 
Is my condition likely temporary or long term? What treatments do you recommend for this disorder? I have other health problems. How best can I manage these together with PTSD? How soon do you expect my symptoms to improve? Does PTSD increase my risk of other mental health problems? Do you recommend any changes at home, work, or school to encourage recovery? Would it help my recovery to tell my teachers or coworkers about my diagnosis? Are there any printed materials in PTSD that I can have? What websites do you recommend? Do not hesitate to ask whatever is on your mind. There's no such thing as dumb questions. Trust me. You just need to know what to expect from your doctor. And your doctor is more likely to ask you a number of questions. So try as much as you can to be prepared. Be ready to answer them to reserve time, to go over any points you want to focus on it. And there are things that they might ask you you might not be comfortable with. But I'm pretty sure some of those questions may include like what symptoms are concerning to you or your loved ones. When did you or your loved ones first notice your symptoms? Have you ever experienced or witnessed a traumatic event? Do you have disturbing thoughts, memories, nightmares, or tra trauma that you've experienced? And do you avoid certain people, places, or situations that remind you of this event? Have you been having any problems at school, work, or in your personal relationship? Or have you thought of harming yourself or others? Do you drink alcohol or use recreational drugs? And how often? Have you been treated for other psychiatric symptoms or mental illness in the past? And if you say yes, what type of therapy was most helpful that you had engaged in in the past? There will be discussions on some other symptoms related to PTSD, like constantly worrying. You might have a hard time concentrating, getting angry easily, having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, fearing that someone will harm you. And there are times when you might have sudden attacks of dizziness, fast heartbeat or shortness of breath, having fears of dying. See, different people from different cultures and different ages have often the same PTSD symptoms, which include these feelings of something always is going to happen. Like people who've been through this life-threatening events may stay on high alert. These people feel tense most of the time. They react as though there's a danger. And even when there is no danger, they still have these reactions. Their bodies react this way to make sure that they won't miss any signs that such an event may occur again. People with PTSD are not able to control feelings of wanting to. They just want to run away. They want to defend themselves, right? They want to be prepared for something terrible or painful that may be happening. That is quite common. I mean, this disorder can greatly affect your health problems, right? Other problems often come with PTSD. Like when people do get depressed, some people do get dizzy and they have this chest pain, stomach problems, they get sick often. You know, uh, I told you about the alcohol or drug use, they try to cope. It be can become a serious problem actually creeping into our relationships. These symptoms of PTSD can make it hard to get along with people. This can lead to problems with family, friends, and co-workers. When a person constantly worries or feels guilty, has poor sleep patterns, uses drugs or alcohol, or has no feelings, these are issues that can strain relationship. It's hard to be with a person who seems to get angry for no reason or who often gets into bad moods. It's also hard to be with a person who will not go out or take in social events. However, there is good news that there are effective treatments. And if you're getting help, it's wonderful, right? It's wonderful for you to get it. We've talked about the counseling and the therapy. We talked about the medication. We've talked about your personal health, taking care of it. And as long as you know where you can try to get some help, you will be in a much better position in coping with it. And remember, it could be a thought that you're going to go through over a period of time, but with the right supports in place, you're going to be fine, right? It's so important that you understand that. 
Well, I'd like to say that we've had a good conversation today. It's been very informative. And for all those people who may think that they show some of the signs of PTSD, what I can strongly recommend is that you at least get yourself checked out. Go for some support. Try to get some people in your family or friends involved. Do not be ashamed at all. Talk about it. You may not be comfortable talking about that traumatic event. However, it is so important for you to be able to communicate your emotions and your feelings and some of your experiences that you may go through. And I want to talk about if you're a supportive person, you're supporting someone with PTSD, please be empathetic and try to understand that they the individuals are going through a lot and they're going to need your support. They don't need your judgment. They don't need you to run away from them. They need support and they need a good listener. And what everyone else is saying, you don't need to be worried about. What you do need to do is take on the role of a supportive person and make sure that you're showing that you care. You're there for the individual. You're not trying to fix them. You're trying to support them. Don't judge them. That's one of the best things you can do is not judge. You're going to need to take care of yourself, your health, because that is how you're going to be able to support them and educate yourself as much as you can about the disorder, right? And if you have to take some time to support someone, please do that because it's imperative that you understand the levels to which this severity could go to based on you know, compounded stressors that are in the person's life or in your life. Just be mindful that there are risk factors that need to be considered. So we've covered a lot of great information and I want you to take care of yourself. Um, love yourself and understand that you're going to go through it and reach out, call 911 in the worst case scenario where you feel that you just have to get out there. Do not try to stress which agency, whatever. The more you take care of yourself. And remember, you are not alone. There is so much going on in this world that can impact all of us. There's so many things that can impact us as human beings that we have to get over these biases, these stereotypes, and these old traditional ways of handling our problems or, or our issues. The best way we can do is just be an open as we can to treatment and support and make sure that you understand you are not alone. So I want to say thank you to all my listeners. Please, if you have someone that's going through this experience, please, if anything that you could do, make sure that you try to support them. Don't force them. Don't push them into a situation they're not comfortable with. Just make sure you are the support. And if you are that person, please get some support. All these strategies that I talked about, if you don't even implement them, like listing or having prepared questions, that's okay. As long as you go in and take care of yourself. So everyone, please be like the wise old bird and spread the word. That's how we get through. We support each other and we actually understand when we need help, we go for it. Okay, that's what we do without judgment. If you have certain feelings, address them. Okay, and if you go to a doctor, this is a big thing. If you go to a doctor who is dismissive, go to another. If you go to a psychotherapist that you really aren't getting along with, don't give up. Go to another. Go where you feel comfortable. You will find someone. If you've tried in the past and you had a bad experience with someone, a doctor, psychotherapist, go to another one. You matter. And that's what's important. You do. You matter. And you have to be the type of person that understands you matter. And you have to take matters into your own hands. Okay? So, a lot of us give up when we have these bad experiences with the health community. Because some of them are overstressed. But what you do is keep on it. Do not give up. And remember, a lot of these things are temporary. They can be temporary emotions or feelings that we're going through. And if we can keep that into perspective, 
then we're going to be a lot better off because then we know we're going to have our ups and downs. And you could be going along fine, and then you could start to get those feelings again. And that's okay. You could work through it. You could learn strategies, self-talk, affirmations, treatments, whatever, to get you back on track. But whatever it is, know that you can get through. So thank you and take care of yourself, people.